Good evening, everybody. My name is Eileen Hebler. I'm part of the Career Connections team, the Director of Career Connections and Career Services at Loyola. It is a pleasure to have everybody here tonight. Thank you for joining us. We are doing these events, Loyola Connect Live, to connect our students with alumni who have jobs or interests and experience within some chosen fields. And tonight we are joined by Erin Anderson. And we're thrilled to have Erin. She is part of the class of 2012. She is joining us from the West Coast from San Francisco. And she has experience in startups and entrepreneurship with a few different companies, including Lyft and Postmates and Airbnb. She is happy to share a little bit about her background as well as give some tips and tricks about the industry. And then after she goes through all that information, we'll be glad to open it up to questions. I see some different folks joining. So welcome to our students and welcome to some other Loyola team members. Wendy Bulger, I see, who Erin said she recognized her name from some events in California. And then I'm also joined by Penelope Flurry on the Career Center team with myself. And then also Charlie Hebler from Alumni Engagement. So we have the, uh, the whole gang is here. And as we see others, we'll let others um, join in. Fun to share too that Aaron's brother is on, Glenn, who's also <laughs> a Loyola alum and also is out in California. So I think we should give <laughs> in San Francisco also in technology. So I think we're getting two Andersons here for the price of one. So yeah. again, Aaron, thank you very much. And with no further ado, I'll turn it over to you to go through a little bit more detail about your background and and why you're interested in spending time with us tonight. Of course, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so for me, my main goal and, and why I joined today and why I'm so excited to talk to you, all of you is, I actually had no idea that startups were even a thing uh, when I was graduating Loyola because I grew up in New York. Like a lot of us who go to Loyola, we have a big mid-Atlantic going. Um, and I just wasn't exposed to the startup world. So when I graduated, I actually ended up working at KPMG. Um, and at that point, I thought it was my dream job. I was really excited about it. Um, and I was in the Selinger Scholars Program, and I worked really hard to get there. And then I showed up on, on day one, and um, I didn't love it. And a lot of my other friends were working for Big Four as well, and um, and just felt underwhelmed with the, the work there. Um, so I spent the next year really looking and exploring alternative paths. Um, I thought I wanted to go work at Deloitte. Um, but luckily, my, my friend at the time, he was really interested in startups. So I spent time helping him look at startups and through that process realized how exciting that might be as an alternative path. Um, breaking into Silicon Valley, was really hard at the time. Um, and that's another reason why I want to be here and, and help support is because I didn't know anyone in it or know anything about it. It was really hard to understand what's the right path. And breaking into a startup is actually quite different from the application process of a larger company. Uh, they actually like when you break the rules um, and not go the traditional path. Um, so how I ended up at Lyft, I think, is an interesting first story, and then I can talk about the other stages of my career throughout the conversation. Um, but I applied for like around 100 startups before I ended up at Lyft, and I felt very discouraged. And I was 22, 23, um, and no one was really looking at my resume. I would maybe get halfway through and look good to one or two rounds, but because I didn't have startup experience, um, and that's not what I studied. I just got overlooked very often to people who were already in the startup community. Um, so what I ended up doing was I was following startups every day on Indeed and all these different websites that showed job postings and Lyft came up and Lyft at this point in time was really small. Um, at this point they had like the big mustache cars and they were in maybe three cities. Um, and I just really fell in love with their job description, which was to launch cities. So in this role, you would go all around the country, um, live out of Airbnbs, 
Uh, this is actually how I learned about Airbnb too. I didn't know what it was at the time. And then I ended up working for them five years later uh, and setting up Lyft in all these new markets. And you really got to be an entrepreneur and own the entire market. Um, but I was pretty young for the position. Um, and I knew that they would ignore my resume if I just sent, sent it in since they were a San Francisco based company and I was in Baltimore and they just didn't know me. So luckily they were launching DC and I got an email about them launching it. So I drove down to DC and they were throwing a big event for a thousand people to celebrate their launch there. So I went um, with the intention of convincing them to hire me. So I went to this big event um, and met the director of launch. And I said, hey, are you hiring? Because I think you should hire me. And he goes, well, we're hiring drivers. And I'm like, no, I think you should hire me to join your team. And he goes, okay, well, why? Why do you think I should hire you? And I pitched him on the reason that I think DC was not a good market for them. I thought it was more of a black car market. Uber at the time only had black cars and Lyft really specialized more in cheaper options that really catered towards more millennials and college students. And I said, you know what, Baltimore would be a fantastic market for you and you should let me launch it for you. And he goes, okay, I really like how bold you are to tell me I'm going to fail today. So why don't I fly you out and meet our founders and you can pitch the same thing. No, we lost her. Oh no. <laughs> Glenn, do you want to text her? Yeah, let me send you a quick message. <laughs> or, or call her. Thank you. Brother to the rescue. I, I set up the Wi-Fi in her house, so uh, I feel guilty here. <laughs> uh, yeah, while she's hopping back on, uh, like Aaron said, uh, my name is Glenn. Um, so I've been out here coming up on four years now, too about that long in the startup world as well. Um, so where Aaron went more of the on-demand uh, startup, so like uh, Airbnb, Lyft, consumer to consumer, I've been mostly in the B2B space, uh, specifically cybersecurity, networking, um, and other development observability tools. So I was an information systems major at Loyola, and I equate a lot of that to how I kind of got into this world um, so uh, I can go a little bit more into detail about that, but some of the classes at Loyola, I think that really spoke to me is like database design, networking, um, apart from the other business core classes that I took, uh, I started first in cybersecurity as a security analyst, then went into, uh, being a technical account manager for a while, uh, jumping into customer success and then back into technical account management, um, so yeah, like I said, I've been out here for four years, started first in New York at a cybersecurity firm working specifically with hedge funds, but uh, it definitely brought me out here to join sort of the startup realm. Uh, similar to tee off what Aaron was, um, uh, was saying is that it can be a little difficult to get into this, uh, this world. You kind of have to set yourself a little differently and the application process is a lot different uh, similar to Aaron, I applied to probably about, uh, I would say, close to 60, 70 startups, got to last round interviews multiple times, only to just not get it. Um, but I think it was a, a blessing in disguise uh, when I, uh, for the first job that I got out here, which was at a subsidiary of uh, Cisco, uh, their cloud networking division called Meraki. Uh, so I did work there for about three years and a uh, really different feel than your average corporate world. Uh, definitely don't have uh, suits and ties or anything like that. Uh, it's like dogs in the office, but you really get to solve some really cool pro problems and it, it can go, everything goes a lot faster, I would say. And you have a lot more autonomy to make decisions than you perhaps would at a big four or a large investment firm. But I can, I can answer any questions while... Uh, well, Aaron uh, is jumping on. I wasn't super prepared for this, so. <laughs> Glenn, I'm glad you were here. Yeah. <laughs> My computer just decided to restart. It, it's had a lot of startup days. Your, your brother was on to save the rescue. You can't make this up. 
He has a very interesting career. And I think uh, his the major he uh, took with information systems um, really prepped him. And I would highly recommend taking that as a major or a minor while you're at Loyola. Yeah, that's am it's amazing that the, both of you kind of have that within your path. I really feel like we're getting two Andersons here for the first time. <laughs> is your brother Anderson or is that a... Is that yeah, we both brother? are. Okay, got it. Got it. Well, if you want to pick up where you were, and sure. We'll, we'll let Glenn tag team back in. I feel like totally. We have, to have, we have to have Glenn back in. <laughs> yeah, he he definitely. We have um, very similar paths, but his is more nerdy tech, as I love to joke with him about. <laughs> like he's way more technical than I am, uh, and he works usually in more B two B type companies, so like business to business, and I work in more B two C type companies, which are more of the consumer brands you've heard of like an Airbnb or a Lyft. Um, both are good in different ways. I'd say B2B usually has a uh, faster exits uh, that we talk about as an exit strategy. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, um, that's how I ended up at Lyft. Um, and that really was the launch pad for my career. I was very young. Um, I was 23. Most people who were on the team were in their late 20s. So I felt really lucky to have that opportunity. Um, and as Glenn was saying, startups just give you a ton of autonomy and a ton of responsibility. So the learning curve is really steep. But my two years there, I got to launch six, no, eight markets. Um, so I launched Baltimore um, and I got to really have my, my full autonomy of what it looked look like when we launched there. I launched New York City. Um, fun fact, Glenn was my intern for launching in New York. So we joked that he really launched New York. Um, since he did such a good job on it. And then after we made grew that into our biggest market, um, I had the oppor opportunity to stay there and be the, the GM as we were building out our GM structure or to come to headquarters. Uh, and then I came to headquarters in San Francisco and that's how I ended up moving here um, and built my own team. Um, I found a problem in the company and they said, great, come here and, and build a team to solve it. Um, so they gave me, you know, a budget and all of these resources, um, which is just so rare to have when you're 24. Um, and then um, built and scaled that. And then I ended up going over to Postmates. So in my two years at Lyft, we went from 80 people to 1200 people. So just immense scale. Um, so my two years there really felt like six years in my career because I just learned so much and I was able to build so many things and have so many things on, on my resume and experience to look back at that um, I actually really loved Lyft and it's like, it will forever be my favorite company. All of my friends are my best friends from there to this day uh, because it was also, I think startups feel a little bit like a family sometimes because you're working and building and solving problems that you're really passionate about with people who are usually pretty young too and building their careers. So it's a really foundational moment um, to have that experience if you're lucky enough when you're young. Um, yeah, so after I was um, there, I still loved Lyft, but I was, I was very young and we were kind of continuing to, to grow the team out and bring more senior people with MBAs. So I felt that I kind of reached my cap there um, and I still was hungry for that, that hyper growth moment. Uh, so I was looking at startups that were kind of where Lyft was um, when I joined or around that size that I could help and grow scale. So Postmates was hiring a director of international expansion. Um, so I emailed the CEO and I said, hey, here's my resume. Um, I see you have this role open. Let me know if you want to talk. I think uh, I think I, I have something to offer you or and, um, not really expecting to hear back. It was me starting to inter think about where I wanted to interview. And he emailed me back in five minutes um, saying with the rest of the executive team saying, hey, uh, I'd love for you to come in this week. Can you come in tomorrow? Um, and that's really how I ended up over at, at Postmates. Um, and I helped grow that business out. And I had a ton of responsibility. I reported to the COO and then eventually the VP of product. And I ran their U.S. strategy around uh, supply and new markets they were going to launch. Um, but ultimately, the culture just wasn't the right fit for me. And delivery just wasn't that exciting for me. So I realized I, I wanted to be at a company that was focused more on 
the human connection. So that's what I really loved about Lyft when I joined. It was small and it reminded me actually of my feeling being abroad, where abroad I felt so at home in hostels because you got to know strangers really quickly in these small places. Um, and that's what I Lyft was trying to do in the beginning. It was trying to create, have uh, friendships sort of happen in cars and authentic relationships. Um, and Postmates, ideally, like you never talk to another human because you have a burrito delivered to you. So I realized it just wasn't aligned with my personal values. Um, and for me, the only place that did next was Airbnb. Um, Airbnb, um, fantastic company. Uh, a lot of Lyft people end up working there too, since their cultures are pretty similar. And I went over there and um, kind of took a bit of an ego hit in the role I took because it's such a hard company to get into. So I spent my first months working in more of a sales role and then um, worked my way up after six months uh, to finding a big problem that they were working on and told my director, you know, pitched a, a similar idea to him that I did when I was at Lyft and saying like, hey, this is a really big problem. I think this is the solution. Like, I think you should put me on this big project. And by going on that big project, uh, I got visibility to the executive team at the company and then was able to build a whole team around that problem, that solution. So it was really focused on their global regulatory problem. So a lot of what you see in the news around Airbnb is governments wanting to regulate them and shutting down Airbnb. But my thought process with the rest of the team was, what if we actually work building products that are good for cities? we regulate ours and they're good for citizens too. Over tourism kind of ruins the whole reason of going there. So how do we add in our own constraints? And then I, I worked on the first global regulation that we did um, in Japan. So I spent a ton of time going back and forth to Japan, which was really great um, and building out their first, it was the first countrywide law we actually wrote in partnership with the country. And then after I built that out, I built it into a playbook and I went to, I launched it in Paris and France and one actually came with me to France for, um, for that business trip. And then we went to the South of France for the weekend. So it was really great. Um, we're very close. And um, yeah, and now um, I loved Airbnb. I was there for three years, um, but I got approached by um, a, a couple of different companies approached me and I felt the, the only stage I didn't do yet was really early stage, which is series A. Um, and this company approached me called Belong, which is where I am now. And I just really fell in love with their mission in a similar way to when I fell in love with Lyft. And their feeling is creating the feeling of home for renters. In our generation, a lot of us will rent for a very long time. And I want to be able to create that feeling of feeling at home for, at, at day one for people. Um, the investing group is really great. It's a similar board to Airbnb. Um, and it gave me a different level of leadership. So I'm on the executive team there. I report to the CEO. Um, I report at the quarterly board meetings. I have one tomorrow. So I was very busy this week and will be busy after this call. Um, but yeah, so that, that's been my career so far, but it really all started with me uh, kind of pushing my way through when I was at Lyft and writing my own path um, and not going the more traditional route. Just sending my blanket resumes out uh, was not working. Wow, Erin, you gave us a lot to digest. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's fantastic. Before we turn it over to the students, I just want to ask a couple broad questions that I think yeah. benefit. So this is still being recorded. We'll stop the recording mm -hmm. when we switch to the student questions, but I think this is valuable for students. So two things that you mentioned that I picked up on that I'd love you to just dive into more. And we hear so much in terms of our work and career services. So you're, you're doing my job tonight. I appreciate that. So the first is the rejection. You mentioned, and Glenn as well, hundreds of applications. And so can you walk us through a little bit? Did you get replies back? Did you get ghosted? Did you follow up? Did you make a hit list and of kind of ones you wanted to funnel that, you know, some type of priority pyramid type thing? Can you just comment on that entire process, please? Totally. That's a great question. Uh, I think rejection is part of the process, particularly in startups um, or anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur, because people, even if you go through fundraising, you're going to get rejected 20 times before you get a yes. And I think 
it really hurts in the moment. Um, and it's about picking yourself back up and saying, you know, that wasn't the right fit for me, or there, there was a fate reason of why it wasn't meant to be. And I ultimately do believe that with Lyft, like when I look back at the other startups, they weren't the right fit and I wasn't the right fit for them. And I was really trying to convince myself that I was, um, and I, I don't think you always need to find the perfect fit. And I do see this very often with younger people who I mentor, where they want to have their dream job their first time around, and it be the perfect manager and the perfect pay and all of these things. And uh, your career is very long, and you're going to learn something at every single point. So really, I think what you should be optimizing for when you are young in your career depending on your financial situation, everyone's different, is where am I going to get the most learning? Because that's really what your first, you know, one to two job should be about, because it sets you up for having more choice later um, on the exact perfect passion and the exact perfect role. Of course, it shouldn't be something that you have no passion for, otherwise you won't want to learn it. Um, so figuring out how am I, am I passionate enough about the learning opportunity here and what we're building um, and the other things I think will fall behind it. I think anytime I chose a role just for pay alone, I was disappointed because money as a motivator uh, doesn't, doesn't fully work for me. Great. And then what about that whole world of like follow-up or did you just sort of let them go if they ghosted yeah. you? Yeah, I think now that I'm I'm older um, and I, I hire people now and I work with our head of people all the time. I think it's very fair to ask for feedback um, and you should. So if you do get rejected and I don't think I did historically and I wish I did, I did because um, you should learn what's working or not working so you can adjust your strategy. So I encourage everyone to do that. There's no harm minute. Um, but I don't think I did it as much when I was younger, since I was likely more insecure and in saying, oh, they rejected me. Like, I don't want to hear why. Um, but you should want to hear why, because it's likely not you. It's not personal. Um, and it's just giving like feedback at my company. We consider it a gift because it's, it's how you get better. It's great. And then the second point, and then we'll turn it over to the students for questions is you mentioned just that direct email to the CEO. Can you comment on that mm -hmm. startup world and sort of, you know, what's that, you know, that playbook or what's that perception or, you know, can you get our students inspired to do that, so to speak, because maybe that's not the same in every industry. So can you talk about it as it relates to this industry? Yeah. And Glenn, like, let me know if you did any of similar things. Um, but for me, I think the Lyft one, I felt I was, I only got to that point at Lyft where I wanted to go and prove myself because I thought I was rejected so many times. I'm like, what do I have to lose at this point? Um, then something that I did quite often, and I still do on LinkedIn, if there's anyone I just want to learn from or I'm interested in, I just message them um, and ask if they have time. Of course, I do it in a way that provides value to them as well. Um, and, you know, half of the time you'll get a response back. People do it to me. I usually respond back. Um, and then regarding the email to the CEO, it was more of one of my guy friends who actually pushed me to do it, where he was like, it's time for you to leave Lyft. Uh, I think you should do this here. I wrote the email for you. Just send it. And I was like, oh, I'm not really ready. Um, and then I figured I have nothing to lose. Let me just send it. Worst case scenario, he just ignores me or thinks I'm crazy, but it's like that very cheesy line of like, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Like you're likely not going to burn bridges by showing that you're really interested in that company. Um, and when people interview with me, if they sent me that email first, I'm more likely, depending on the size of our company, we're small, to push them up on my recruiting pipeline. Um, so I'm like, oh, they're actually really interested and passionate in this company. They've done their research. I think the emails that don't work are ones that are like, hey, I'm interested in this company. You don't give any reason why you're passionate about it. You don't give any reason why you want to work there. And you're just asking for something, but you're not offering the value of why they should pick you. That's great. Really helpful. So at this point, well, Glenn, what about you? That's great. Oh, Glenn, you want to get ahead, Glenn? Yeah, yeah, I would say uh, at my uh, previous role, I uh, interviewed probably like two to 300 different people for um, like slightly below us uh, or slightly below my role. 
And I would, I would sort of tee off of what, what Aaron said. Um, the people that sort of got through the first two rounds um, after getting that, that phone interview really, really set themselves apart and provided like what value they were going to bring other than just like the pure job description. Like they mm -hmm. told me something about the product that I didn't even know. Like that is one thing. They really, really did their homework, really did their research and read the website between the lines. Like not just like anyone can regurgitate whatever the like sales or the vision is that they see on the website, but you were able to understand how this product worked, what was the product market fit and how you could, um, essentially like leverage that more. So that is super, super critical uh, when either shooting that first email, crafting that first email, or if you're at the point of getting that phone interview, um, yeah, just really do your homework, really understand it, almost try to pitch the product to the mirror or something, because um, that's super critical. And it shows that you're really bought into the vision and not just the like, you know, salesy front of house vision. Great, really, really helpful. The Anderson duo.